a battery-powered self-flying drone on a battery-powered self-driving car. Didn't think I was going to see that by 2017. It's actually a Tesla Model S, the king of all electric cars. I've picked this one up from eVision in Kent. I'm going to do a road trip of about four or 500 miles, see how the whole electric car thing stacks up. I'm going to drive up to the Peak District in Derbyshire, which is over 200 miles away, so I'm definitely going to have to charge it up on the way. If you're new to electric cars, then stick around, because you're going to need to know this stuff. Because on the 7th of July, Tesla started producing the uh, Model 3, which is touted as an electric car for the masses. So we're all going to be driving them soon. For all you electric vehicle newbies like me, we're going to have to get used to some new terms like kilowatt hour, electric highway, fast charging, rapid charging, frunk, yep, frunk. It refers to the front trunk. It's where the diesel engine used to be. We don't need that anymore because we've got electric motors and they're tiny in comparison. The other term I like is autopilot and it's my favorite feature of this car. So if I pull this lever twice, Cars driving itself. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Two of the most common questions that people seem to have about these cars is about range and battery degradation. From what I can tell with these Teslas, the range is about 230 miles. Perhaps you Tesla owners could let us know in the comments below. But if that bothered you, you could always fork out for the amazing 100D, which does 330 miles. When it comes to battery degradation, it seems that's a non-issue too. There's 286 Tesla owners online that have been keeping a track of their battery performance since 2014. I'll leave a link in the description. The data they've collected reveals that after 50,000 miles, you'll lose around 5% of the capacity of your battery. And then it takes another 150,000 miles, so that's 200,000 miles in total, before it gets down to around 92%. That's 200,000 miles, and you've still got 92% capacity of your battery. How many of us have kept a car for 200,000 miles? Fuel economy is slightly more complicated. You need to stop thinking about miles per gallon and start thinking about kilowatt hours per 100 miles. But think of it this way. If you pay your energy provider 12p a kilowatt hour, and this battery's a 75 kilowatt hour battery, that's gonna cost you around nine pound to fill it up from zero to full. So that's around 3.9 pence per mile, and that's assuming you've got no solar panels. Compare that to the 10.5p per mile of a 50 mile per gallon car, and you can see it soon starts to stack up. Also, remember, this is a big car, so that's a generous comparison. And some of the smaller electric cars can be run for under two pence a mile. Plus, you're saving a huge amount on maintenance because there's not a lot of moving parts. So, will I be buying an EV for my next car? Well, as long as it's got a range of about 150 miles or more, I'll definitely be having a look at them. The biggest inconvenience with EVs is the charging on long journeys, but that turned out to be much easier than I thought it was going to be. I did about 600 miles and I had to charge it three times. It would have only been twice if I'd have had charging facilities at our accommodation. By the time I'd stopped for a quick coffee and a toilet break, I'd added about 150 miles to my range. And of course, 90% of the time, when you're using it in normal everyday use charging at home every night, it's more convenient than the diesel. So as long as the infrastructure can keep up with the demand, then I will definitely be part of the EV revolution very soon. So the uh, autopilot on uh, the Tesla is really for uh, using on motorway. I don't think it's supposed to be used down uh, A roads and B roads, but I want to see what it can do. It does say in the manual about, it can get confused about white lines, about potholes, about shadows. Obviously I wouldn't advise trying this yourself. You need to be fully aware of what's going on so you can quickly take back control of the car. So we'll put it in, that's in autopilot mode. We're doing. 40 miles an hour, we're coming up to a bend, so let's just see how it'll cope with that. 
That's quite a sharp bend. I don't know if I'm brave enough. No, I'm going to take control. <laughs> that was that felt like, that felt too dangerous. I don't know. I, I think it would probably be okay, but I'm not prepared to risk it. It's an expensive car, so we'll try again. It seems to be coping okay with the shadows. That doesn't seem to be bothering it at all. We have got some clear white painted lines on the road. So we've got a gentle right-hander. Let's see what it does with that. It's slowing down, slowing down to 35. It's a little bit confused. No, it manages that fine. I've got the cruise control set at 40 miles an hour. Um, but if the car doesn't know what quite what's going on, it slows down to compensate, I think. It seems to put itself between the two white lines, in the middle of the two white lines. I have noticed that chevrons confuse it it seems to go to the outside white line and the and the white line on the left hand side and put you in the center of that which is obviously not the center of the mark lane so we've got another left hand bend coming up uh it's quite sharp so it does so it down to 30 through it's slightly confused now i'm going to take control <laughs> so now we're going left hand bend it's sticking quite far across to the center line but it's coping okay with it I don't think autopilot is really designed for these, this situation. And actually, it's supposed to be a driver assist, but actually you have to concentrate much more than if you were just driving naturally, because you've got to be ready to take over at a moment's notice. What well, is a cyclist? Let's see what will happen with the cyclist. Yeah, no, that's too close to the cyclist, you see. So you have to be ready to take control. See, the shadows are, shadows, I think the shadows are confusing. It's slowed down to 30 mile an hour. Here's another bend. It's slowing down, slowing down to the centre line. It's got over the centre line. So <laughs> it does get a little bit confused. It's not very smooth because it's, it's trying to uh, adjust all the time. Like I say, I think this is designed for motorway use, really. Here's another bend, slowing down to 38 miles an hour. Cruise control set at 45. And again, slowing down it, it seems to slow down to process all the information that's coming in and deal with the bend and then speed up again so it's quite it's not a very smooth ride it's sort of it's quite jerky whereas ordinarily if you were driving obviously you'd slow down and you would take the bend nice and smoothly another bend a left hand bend and it's it really slows down quite quickly it's not asked me to take control yet, so it's dealing with it quite well. It's just not dealing with it in the smoothest manner. It's gone right over to the left-hand edge. <laughs> so it's a bit disconcerting. You do, your, your immediate response is to grab hold of the steering wheel. But obviously I want to see what it's going to do. And it's quite easy to take back control. You just have to put a, you just have to put a forceful input in and it, it gives you back, steering back. But it can be a bit disconcerting. We've got a left-hand bend coming up that's underneath the trees. So we're going to go from light to dark and a left-hand bend. So let's see what happens here. It's quite a sharp bend. Slowing... Oh, no, bus coming. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with the bus. So you do have to keep your wits about you. It's not foolproof. See, that's too far over to that centre line. That's not safe. Like I say, it's not, it's not really for this situation. It's... It's more for motorway use, and it works really well on the motorway. You do have to keep your hands on the steering wheel because it'll it'll uh, tell you off. And see, like this situation where there's people on the side of the road, I'm going to take control because it does sometimes do some unpredictable things when when it gets confused. It tries and sorts it. It tries to sort it out, but it will dart about a little bit until it know until it knows exactly where it is. So we've got a cyclist coming up on the left. You see auto steers now it's spotted the cyclist. So it's slow see it thinks the cyclist is a car, so it's slowed right down to the cyclist speed. It's reading that as a car. Now obviously it's not going to go past so I'll have to take control and because we've got plenty of juice we can really fly past. It works very well on on straight slight bends as soon as the road gets a bit twisty it, it just doesn't feel right it just doesn't feel right it's it's darting around all over the place trying to find the edges of the road uh, but like i say it's not really designed for that but it's interesting to see what it can do it is very clever there's a lot of computing going on 
Let's see, this is just too twisty here. It's, it's not going to deal with this. Well, that, it's, it'd just be too nerve wracking. But another feature of the autopilot is this adaptive cruise control that goes right down to zero miles an hour. And that is really useful, especially in traffic. So we'll latch onto this car in front. I've got it set at 50. Now it's going to keep a distance from that car in front. We're doing 35 miles an hour now. And it will speed up to 50 miles an hour. So we've got traffic lights now, so it should stop. So it's noticed the car in front is going to come up to us. So I'm doing nothing now. It's latched onto that car in front, which has obviously gone down to zero miles an hour. And now it's going to wait for that car to pull away and then we'll pull away. I'm not, I'm not touching the accelerator pedal, brakes or anything. The car's doing this all by itself. All I'm doing is steering. But again, with, uh, there are limitations to that too. If I've noticed if a car, if it's a sharp bend, it'll lose the car. So we should pull away now. So it's lost the car and it's gonna speed up around that corner really quick because it doesn't know we're going around the corner. <laughs> so like I say, there are limitations. I just wanna quickly show you this. When you're out and about in your Tesla and you find you're running a bit low on juice, you just press this little button and it tells you where the nearest supercharger is and how many stalls are available. How cool is that? And it's simple stuff like that that enhances the enjoyment of owning these vehicles. And that's the point really. If we're going to make a green sustainable future then we need to make it an exciting compelling place to be that people want to strive for.